Greetings and welcome. In this video, we address a question of immense practical importance. Since I lived and surfed among the youth of India all my life, I've had the opportunity to listen to their concerns and to understand their predicament and uh, in particular recognize some of the puzzles that bother them. Foremost among them is the question, how do I recognize the will of God concerning me? Is there something called the will of God that applies to me or is it a piece of fiction? Uh, so there is a need to address this question and I hope to do so in the course of this video. Uh, by way of introduction, let me only say this, that all our life we are being shaped by individuals, institutions, agencies, forces beyond our individual life. Uh, in a sense, we are constantly acted upon. Though we get the impression that we are free, autonomous individuals who choose and decide for themselves, for the most part, this is actually an illusion of autonomy. We are being constantly pressure squeezed into situations, shapes and dispositions of, uh, uh, regarding which we don't have much of a choice. Uh, we are as much uh, the creation of our times uh, as uh, we appear to be uh, free and autonomous individuals who choose for themselves and act independently of external forces. So uh, there's really no difficulty in recognizing that there are a thousand wills that continuously apply to us and act upon us. Uh, the will of your family, for example, family members, the will of your friends, the will of your teachers, the will of your institution, the will of your church, leaders, uh, the public opinion, political leadership, economic pressures, social compulsions, cultural norms, anything and everything that your personal life comprises uh, is a domain of a crowd of wills acting upon you all the time. Since from birth onwards we are used to it, we take this for granted, we consider this to be the norm and therefore we neither question this nor express any resentment. Uh, as a matter of fact, over a period of time we develop a craving and a taste for being led by others. Um, we, we, we become eager and willing to surrender our freedom to someone or the other beyond us. Uh, this is the reality in our social public life. Uh, I don't think anyone who has any sense of uh, reality at all will dispute this. But we have great difficulty in realizing or in even recognizing that there is a possibility of something beyond the physical, the mundane, that is also acting upon us something beyond the visible, something beyond the empirical, something beyond the already manifest. Uh, in Hindu philosophy, reality is divided into two. The manifest reality, the world that you see around you is the manifest reality. Then there is the unmanifest. In fact, God is the unmanifest. The unmanifest is imbued with the eagerness to manifest itself progressively and therefore even in Western uh, um, uh, theological thinking, uh, God is understood also as the impulse, a kind of creative impulse that continuously reveals itself in uh, variegated forms. Um, uh, certainly this is a sense in which Hegel understands history. History as a domain of spirit's continuous quest for self-expression. Uh, let me go, not go into the uh, domain of philosophy over much, lest this sounds too dif uh, more difficult than it needs to be. So I'm someone who really believes that human life 
is acted upon both by empirical forces or physical forces and also metaphysical forces. And uh, being, uh, if I would, if I am to use the religious language, I would say, we are acted upon both by the will of men and by the will of God. Now the question is, which is better for us? Now obviously the will of man is shaped by all that happened in the past. Human beings cannot be otherwise than this. We are all the creations of the past. And therefore, when human wills act upon us and we are merely exposed uh, and we are willing only to be exposed to the operations of the many human wills acting upon us, what happens is that we get stuck in the status quo. And we begin to be cynical about a state of affairs or a scheme of things that, are, uh, that is radically different from what it is now. Whereas, history also tells us that there have been crowning moments in human history when, by the operation of something that cannot be explained even through the sum total of all the empirical forces at work, Humanity came to the threshold of something extremely and altogether unprecedented. And this is what is called radical action, as against repetitive action. Uh, you can have two different ideas of history. Either you can see history as a, an endless repetition of the same cycle of possibilities. Or you can see history as a domain of linear progress, where you progress forward, uh, therefore, uh, the um, unfolding experiences of humankind cannot be understood uh, totally in terms of what happened in the past because something radically new is coming into being. And from the religious perspective, the birth of what is radically new is made possible by the will of God or the, the incidents of that is falling upon, the incidents of the will of God on the human condition. If I may represent it like this, human experience, the, the empirical or physical or worldly experience goes horizontally like this, but there are critical moments in history when there's a vertical incidence of something beyond the physical and the uh, empirical onto the horizontal plane, uh, introducing radical and revolutionary possibilities. One such event is the birth of Jesus Christ and the mission of Jesus Christ in particular. Not so much the birth as the mission of Jesus Christ and Jesus announcing the coming of the kingdom of God, which cannot be understood by the principles of any kingdom, even the greatest of empires that existed in history, till then and since then. It is radically new. So this I believe. Now therefore, if we believe that there is something called the will of God, how do we recognize this? I'm going to give three or four um, checklists, so to speak, which you can apply if you're inclined to and decide for yourself. First of all, I believe that uh, the will of God almost always concerns the birth or the interruption. Eruption is like this, interruption is like this. The interruption of something radically new either in the experience of the individual or in the experience of humankind, often both. Uh, if there is something radically new in your own experience, then surely it is not a privilege given to you to constitute a private uh, treasure. It's meant to be shared with all. It's envisaged as a blessing on humanity at large. So uh, let's consider a couple of instances to understand this. Take uh, the case of a birth that happened 600 years before the birth of Jesus, the birth of Prince Siddharth, who later on became Gaudamadi, Buddha. Now, at a critical moment in his life, Gautama, the prince, Siddharth, the prince, decides that he has to leave everything, leave all the material wealth, the, the life of pleasure, the life of power, the most coveted state, as well as uh, you know, the historical experience of man is concerned and to renounce everything and go into the unknown, unknown. He becomes the pathfinder, the Tathagata, 
the pathfinder. So something new, absolutely new. The same pattern you find in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus breaks upon the stale religious domain of Judaism as the eruption of something unprecedented, something absolutely fresh and fragrant. fragrant. So uh, it's very clear that this is the will of God concerning Jesus, that he has not come to repeat the old stuff, but to reveal something radically different from all that has gone on before. And therefore, to the extent that Jesus has that element in him, he has also spiritual authority. And the gospel writers in particular emphasize the spiritual authority of Jesus. When the Sermon on the Mount ends, Matthew writes, he's, yeah, the people were astonished because he taught not like the Pharisees and Sadducees. He taught them with authority. And that authority is the authority of something completely new, radically new breaking into the domain of human existence. So one test we can apply is whether or not this pertains to something radically new, <clears throat> which also means <coughs> something that challenges us to go beyond the individual calculations of profit or loss, pleasure or pain. More of that may be later. <coughs> Pardon me. The second test we can apply is, and this is perhaps personal, now if there is a flaw in your character, and since God expects perfection of his people, God intervenes in your life to lead you out of that flaw or that imperfection. Now to take a biblical example to make this idea clear, there was a flaw in the personality of Peter, and he was impulsive, and that had to be corrected. So you have the event recorded in the 26th chapter of Matthew's Gospel where Peter is made to deny Jesus three times. That denial each time happens impulsively. And Jesus makes him confront that reality because if he is to uh, shoulder this great responsibility to be the uh, metaphoric foundation of the church as stated in the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, uh, by the way, the authenticity of this verse is hotly debated, but I don't want to go into that. Uh, if Certainly, Peter was to play a very important role in the times to come, and therefore his personality had to be fine-tuned, had to be purified, had to be strengthened. And this flaw in him had to be eradicated. And therefore, it was God's will that he go through this experience. And Jesus therefore predicts it. He says, uh, Peter, three times before the croc, uh, cock crows. You will deny me three times. It happens. So that's a prediction. Uh, Jesus' prediction pertains to the will of God concerning Peter. And the scope of that particular instance of God's will concerning Peter was to rectify a very serious flaw in his spiritual personality, mainly his inclination to act on the spur of the moment, act impulsively, which actually smacks of immaturity because impulsive action obstructs the revelation of God's will. We have to wait upon the Lord to understand what it is that God wants us to do and that rules out impulsive action. That's the reason why this flaw had to be corrected in the spiritual personality of Peter. So that's the second test. Whether or not this particular possibility uh, to which God is leading us will result in a correction in our personality. The third test that I would apply to myself is this, whether or not this action that is contemplated, the thing that I have to do, the possibility that uh, in front of me, does that have a larger significance? A larger, rather than only personal scope and personal interest. Let me give you a personal experience to make it clear. In 2007, I became the principal of St. Stephen's College. At that time, I was working as a member of the National Commission, which by protocol is a much, much higher position than being the principal of a college because in principle, all minority institutions in the entire country was under the jurisdiction of my commission. And therefore, St. Stephen's was also under my jurisdiction. In fact, all central universities also was under the jurisdiction of my commission. So even the vice chancellor of Delhi University had to answer a directive issued by my commission 
Therefore, becoming the principal of St. Stephen's College was not a promotion for me, but it was stepping down several notches. But that's not the point that I want to make. When this need arose that I come back to St. Stephen's as its principal, the question that was uppermost in my mind was, why am I going back? Why should I go back? How do, you, how do I know whether or not this is the will of God concerning me? And I spent a moment, in uh, not a moment, a fairly long spell of time in meditation and soul searching. And ultimately, the realization dawned on me very clearly with surprising clarity that that was indeed God's will for me because suddenly I saw a great opportunity to start a dialogue, a debate, a national debate in India on the nature of higher education, particularly the need to integrate social justice and excellence in higher education. And that was a domain untouched by others. And such a debate had never happened. And everything that happened in my tenure lasting nearly nine years uh, actually centers on this. Uh, I was able to start a national debate on the importance of integrating commitment to social justice with pursuit of excellence in higher education. And the details of which cannot be narrated in one video or even a hundred videos. I've written a book about it. If you're interested, you may uh, get a copy from Amazon. Uh, the title of the book is On a Stormy Course. It deals with the turbulence that erupted on account of this pursuit on my part. So I knew very clearly that that was God's will for me. Therefore, I was willing to put up with any difficulty, any loss, any threat to my life. In fact, I faced on many occasions threats to my life. So this is the third test that I apply, where the scope of the action that's, in, that's contemplated is limited to myself, my personal comfort, convenience or profit, or would it have a larger significance, in which case a significance that I cannot control with my personal abilities alone, and therefore uh, I'm reasonably sure that God is calling me to do something significant, the f benefit of which will help others. And I. Uh, without any heed to what I may get out of it. In fact, the possibility of suffering and the possibility of losing everything. I had to risk being uh, 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 the principal every moment of my life in order to pursue God's will concerning the institution concerning higher education in this country. The th fourth test I would apply to myself is whether or not a reorientation is needed in my life as a whole. A good example for this is the instance of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. You are very familiar with that instance. It's found in the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel, and therefore I'm not going to explain the textual details. What happens to the encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus, and that event clearly is ordained of God, otherwise it would never have happened. There is no way otherwise Jesus would have come face to face with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was in an entirely different plane of existence, different sphere of activity. It had nothing to do with the mission of Jesus Christ. But God brings about this tremendous face-to-face, -face, which transforms the personality of Zacchaeus. And a complete reorientation takes place. It's, it's enough to say that the man whose entire lust was in grabbing and accumulating and hoarding, discovers a new delight of freedom in giving and giving and giving and giving generously and giving sacrificially. And that's how that uh, episode ends. Uh, so that's the uh, fourth test I'd apply to uh, f uh, deciding whether or not um, this is really God's will for me. I face a situation, it looks maybe attractive, maybe it looks very daunting, difficult, dangerous, I'm scared. In that context, would I go by my instincts, my sense of what is desirable and what is not, what is smart and what is not, what is foolish? Or would I go by the larger awareness as to what it is that God is calling me to do? So, um, first of all, uh, will this result in the unveiling of something radically new? Secondly, will this result in the rectification of, of an important flaw in my character? Third, would it involve the big picture in which I am placed? Is there something that God wants me to unveil and, and, and bring to the notice of other people so that a new prospect, a new vision is born? And fourth, uh, in order to, will this 
uh, bring about a reorientation in my own personality. Um, and I have to say here that very often all these things cannot be seen clearly. And therefore, there is also the need to act in faith. In fact, I would explain or I would understand faith largely as the freedom by which we are willing to be open to the promptings of the higher force, promptings of God. And faith is the empowering agency that enables us to accept and obey the will of God. That's the main function of faith. So many people think that faith is the means for uh, doing, uh, performing miracles. That's not the spiritual idea of faith. Faith is primarily the force or that wonderful specific condition in which we are willing to recognize and obey the will of God. And that leads us into all these wonderful experiences and possibilities that I have been uh, mentioning. But above everything else, there is a fifth test that I would apply, and that is, if I face a situation, every situation has two possibilities. Either I can go this way or I can go that way. Now suppose this is the way of God for me, the will of God for me. Now, very often when we face such a situation, and every situation has at least two possibilities. Human nature being what it is, most people choose one of the two options in terms of what is least troublesome and most profitable or pleasurable. But there is another test, and that is, what is, what, what is the option wherein my self-will is least active? where my interests are minimum, where my selfishness is eradicated. And if I'm acting out of a concern of what is ultimately in my best interest, then very likely I'm not following the will of God. I'm following only my own uh, very smart and uh, inspired sense of selfishness, what is good for myself. On the other hand, if the way that I'm going to choose is likely to be authenticated or punctuated by suffering. That is to say, no profit at all. I stand to gain nothing by taking this option, this road less traveled by, as the American poet Robert Frost says. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Summer ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. So, Will I take the less traveled by road? And that the hallmark of the less traveled by road is suffering. Jesus accepted the path of suffering. Even uh, at the outset of his public ministry, he knew that he came to suffer and to die. The Son of Man has come to die. Which means that the option that he has accepted for himself is a pure, entirely free from any personal selfish interest. And that is a guarantee that he's walking in the path of righteousness, walking in fulfillment of God's plan for him, God's will for him. And therefore, when Jesus says that fulfilling the will of God is for me, my food and my drink, we know that he is stating the absolute truth. He is not saying something for the sake of it. He is not saying, uh, he is not exaggerating the case. He is stating the exact truth. That's the most sincere statement. In, te in technical language, sincerity means the perfect match, the blend between words and the inner state or sentiment, sentiment, sincerity. A statement of absolute, pure sincerity. So, my dear friends, there is something called the will of God. And as Jesus warns us, uh, when we look at the will of God, from the perspective of the world, it seems the narrow way. And Jesus says, only very few people walk the narrow way. A majority of people in this world who are conditioned by the ways of the world will be attracted by the broad gate, the broad way, which is the way of following one's own instincts, impulses and interests. And that keeps you uh, confined to a very small, narrow world. Of, uh, of, of repeated possibilities without any breakthrough. You know, it's like a cycle, a spiral. There is no breakthrough. Whereas, if you take the narrow path, initially it looks daunting, uh, it might even scare you, 
but that's a path that leads to a radical breakthrough and that becomes the entry point to something unprecedented, something that uh, uh, passeth the understanding of the world. So, uh, give, give this a try. I've given you a checklist of four or five um, uh, uh, insights or norms uh, to decide whether or not the option that you're going to exercise is done in the direction of um, recognizing and obeying the will of God or of going after the ways of the world and the outcomes will vary very radically, dramatically depending on which option you choose and uh, the consequences of that choice will last until eternity. May God bless you.